In this uh, video, I want to consider a concept that I call provisional hospitality. So first of all, let's talk about hospitality. Hospitality is, of course, making space for another, uh, particularly someone from outside of your comfort zone. Hospitality, in a Christian sense, certainly, is not simply about having your friends over for dinner. It's having the stranger over for dinner. It's making space for people who are outside of your comfort zone. Now, in terms of dialogue, uh, hospitality is then the matter of dialoguing with and making space for people who are outside of your comfort zone or outside of your worldview or perspective. Now, Henry Nouwen said this very well when he said that listening is the highest form of hospitality. There's no bigger way to express hospitality than truly to make space for another person's point of view and to listen to them. But it seems to me that there is also a sense where there are limits to our hospitality. In other words, there are certain conversations that we no longer typically grant the space of hospitality to listen to dissenting perspectives. Uh, for example, uh, this is kind of a bizarre story, but I'm just going to tell you the story. The first um, Evangelical Theological Society conference I ever attended was about 20 years ago. I think it was 2002 when it was in uh, Boulder, Colorado. I was sleeping in my station wagon because I was still a poor postgraduate student. Um, and I went to the conference and the first paper I went to hear, I was sitting in the room and then they announced that the paper topic had changed and the original topic had been moved to another room. So this was now a history paper. So I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to stay because it's more trouble to go to another room. And then this guy started giving the paper and the paper that he gave was essentially on Holocaust denial. He was Although he was a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, he affirmed the doctrine of biblical inerrancy and the doctrine of the Trinity, which is all that they require for their membership and their organization. He denied that six million Jews were killed during World War II by the Nazis. And he started giving a historical argument for this. Now, uh, my response, and I think the response of most people in the room was, we're not even entertaining you. Uh, Holocaust denial is not a serious question for us, so that we no longer extend the hospitality of listening to you that we might at one time have granted. Let's say in the immediate wake of World War II, people are uh, in the fog after the war, they're sort of disputing the numbers, and you could maybe at that time have a person who might argue for a critique of some of the high numbers of deaths in the concentration camps. But hey, uh, this is conversation has been going on for 70 some years now. We're clear on the fact that people were murdered, that it was approximately 6 million, if not more, in terms of Jews. And so we're not interested in hearing your Holocaust denial paper at this time anymore. We no longer extend the hospitality of, of, of uh, conversation to you. Uh, certainly that was my response. Uh, and what that illustrates is this idea that there is a space, there is a grace period, you can say, where dissenting views, and particular views that we consider potentially to be immoral, to be harmful or destructive in some other way, that we initially, we are granting them the hospitality to listen to their perspective and then to offer rebuttals to it. But there comes a time where you're going to move on and no longer extend that hospitality to that view. Uh, in the 19th century, it was common in some Christian circles to defend the institution of slavery. And so there were theologians who would give elaborate theological, hermeneutical, and ethical justifications for the institution of slavery. And those who were uh, abolitionists and who thought that was an appalling use of scripture and, and a bad theological and hermeneutical arguments, nonetheless would engage with those folk because of the provisional hospitality that they extended to them, that they recognized at that time that this was a serious conversation, but eventually the Christian community would need to move to a point where we're no longer going to consider that a live question and we no longer extend the hospitality to those dissenting views. Uh, the same thing you could find, I think, within, let's say, the Mormon church. Uh, so Mormon, the Mormon religion, I should say, not 
to give the impression that Mormonism is another Christian denomination, but the Mormon religion has this view of which I think is overtly racist. And the view is that well, the people existed in a previous life prior to their birth in, into their current bodies. This is a Mormon view that there was a spiritual disembodied pre-existence, that in that pre-existence, certain people did not fight for the kingdom of God with adequate fervor. And so they were given the mark of Cain, which is dark skin, when they were born into this life in this world. And as a result, up until I think 1978, the Mormon church, the LDS church, did not allow black people to... Um, I think it's take on the Melchizedek priesthood and enter into temples. And they we retracted that position in 1978 or whenever that changed. Uh, so I'm not up on all the details, but it seems to me that that is an overtly racist view. Uh, and hopefully within Mormon theology, people that would still defend that theology of exclusion of black people should no longer be countenanced. They, they should be excluded. We should, they should not extend the provisional hospitality to that perspective. Now we get into some other issues. Um, one of the interesting issues for me is the dispute between Christian complementarians who believe that there are certain roles within the church and society and the home, uh, which should be reserved for men only, certain roles of leadership, and that women should not have those same roles because of their gender. It, it seems to me as an egalitarian that those views are sexist ultimately and that they're indefensible. Uh, I'm aware, however, not only that there are many, many complementarians, but I'm aware that they have their own theological and hermeneutical arguments to defend their complementarian views that exclude women from certain roles of leadership within the church and the home. And so I think we're still in the space of a provisional hospitality toward the complementarian position. We need to have that debate and continue to have the debate. And that means giving the other the hospitality of listening to their position. But it is my view that if I'm right, that the complementarian view is ultimately sexist uh, and has an indefensible view of excluding women from leadership, much like the Mormon church had an indefensible view of excluding black people from leadership, then I do hope and anticipate that there will come a time where we'll no longer extend the provisional space of hospitality to seriously countenance the views of the complementarian. Now, I don't see that happening anytime soon. It's gonna be a while, but I do hope, and um, in my view, that in the long trajectory of history, we get to a point where complementarianism has become another one of those views for which we no longer give it the space of hospitality to have a serious conversation about excluding women from certain roles within the church. And that brings me finally to my book, Jesus Loves Canaanites, which I've been talking a lot about recently. So uh, there are these views that I critique in the book, particularly the views that I call the genocide apologists and the just war interpreters who defend the slaughter of Canaanites in history uh, as an action that they believe was commanded by God and and also the driving them out of the land, in essence, ethnic cleansing, that they're defending those actions. So people who take those views are defending the idea that sometimes genocide and, and or ethnic cleansing are morally justified or even morally obligatory actions. Now, in my book, it seems, I've argued, and it seems to me correct, that they are not ever morally obligatory or even morally permissible actions, that genocide and ethnic cleansing are always wrong actions. And they are fundamentally corrupting of the perpetrators, those who carry out those actions. Um, and so while I, at the current um, state of conversation, I think we're in the position of provisional hospitality toward genocide apologists and just war interpreters. Uh, I think that um, I want to work toward the point where those are no longer positions seriously countenanced any more than it is seriously countenanced today to defend uh, slavery as an institution or to defend Holocaust denial as a serious point of conversation. Now that might sound controversial to somebody. I suspect it will because of course there are many people uh, who do defend genocide apologetics today and who do defend the just war interpreters position. But I have to be intellectually honest with myself. It seems to me that those are morally unconscionable positions to defend. The defense of genocide, the defense of ethnic cleansing, the defense of the moral licitness and even moral obligation to slaughter civilian populations, 
ought to become a position which strikes us as fundamentally irreconcilable with Christian devotion and discipleship, no less than the action of defending the institution of slavery. So as we have moved in Christendom in the West beyond the point where we extend provisional hospitality to defenses of slavery, so I hope in the future we do get to the point where we will no longer extend that provisional hospitality to people who want to exclude women from the pulpit and people who want to defend the moral propriety of slaughtering civilian populations in at least in the ancient world and in principle potentially again in the future. So that's my position. Uh, we are in a position now of extending provisional hospitality to these views. But if I'm right in my position, then hopefully we will get to the point where it is no longer considered obligatory or even expected or appropriate to extend provisional hospitality to those views at some point in the future.